Instagram all the way. So um, this is a great one. It's kind of weird right now. 111. It's not a typo. We are live. Yeah. Uh, episode 111 of Startup Business Q&A. Thank you, everyone, for jumping in here. This is a big, big week. There's a lot on. And um, uh, I've got some great questions. So thanks to everyone who sent them through. But I also want to talk about um, the way we handle adversity and not in a kind of a rah-rah motivational sense of things, but actually how you deal with some things when they're thrown at you. So on Wednesday this week, we've got the Entrepreneur Business Live event. Um, that will be running uh, in London. Um, it will be running at WeWork, Devonshire Square. I'm really excited about it. But not every event you run or not every business you build can go swimmingly. Often there are issues and problems. And wow, there's been a baptism of fire, this one. We had a great um, event back in um, August with Kurt McAdanty, a great one before that in July as well. But this one, so uh, one of the speakers sadly has had to pull out. Uh, so it leaves us with three rather than four. And in addition, we've had you know, when every event you have people who buy the tickets and sometimes people can't uh, make it, that's fine. That's how that's just life. But then there's been there's been more than usual who just simply can't make it. So that's really tough as well. We've lost a considerable number. And as a result, it's like, right, what can we do here? Either you panic or what you do is you jump straight in and start fixing it. So um, uh, with a loss of a speaker and, and with a um, few people who had to cancel, it's been a case of saying, right, Let's get in there and fix this. I still want it to be a viable event. I've seen in the past events that cancel because they just don't feel they've got enough people. I, I think if you can make a great event and if you can get the people in there, it can work. And there's plenty of time still. So I've been throwing new people into the event. I'm really pleased that we're filling the numbers up again. But, you know, these things happen. And um, it's interesting because the reaction to it should always be rather than, oh, no, that's going to ruin my event. It's OK. Isn't this fun? This is a challenge. And look at it from a perspective of, you know what, in the future, I'll look back and say, do you know what? When I built the events, that one in September, wow, that was a bastard <laughs> because there were so many things that went wrong. And, and, you know, we've had issues in the past with them and we've always come through because the attitude with them is it's a it's a fun challenge. You don't want it, everything to go really well all the time because that's boring. It's fun. And you. And this may seem absurd, but if you can convince yourself of that, then you'll enjoy and embrace the issues themselves. Michelle, lovely to see you here. Uh, I really hope I can see you on Wednesday. I don't know if you can make it or not, but it'd be great to see you there if you can make it. If anyone can't make the event, never fear, because live in Facebook, uh, on the sorry, in the Entrepreneur Business Group in Facebook, uh, you can watch the live stream of the uh, speakers. So that will be from 6.30 London time on Mon on oh, sorry, on Wednesday this week. Uh, for an hour, we'll have the speakers streaming there. So I'm really looking forward to that. We've also got new people involved. So we've got the um, the photographer from, la photographer from last time. So we're going to have some great pictures. We've also got a videographer this time as well. So we're stepping up every single time and um, learning so much as we go. So thank you, every one of you. Before I start this, I just want to say thank you all for the support. Uh, it means a lot for, uh, to me that you you guys have. But today's uh, Entrepreneur Business Live, um, sorry, <laughs> today's Startup Business Q&A is an AMA. It's an Ask Me Anything. So anyone uh, has a question relating to startup businesses that they want to ask, or if there's a question you think is good that needs to be asked and answered uh, that other people can benefit from, then do put it out here as well. Uh, Henna, hello and welcome to you. So on Facebook here, Henna Hussein has just jumped in and she'll be doing a live stream today in the Entrepreneur Bus Business group on Facebook. Uh, for the next week or two now, we're having every day one of the members uh, gets um, access to do a live stream and share some value. So you're up today. Looking forward to that. Uh, and it's all about building this community that matters. And indeed, that will be what I'm speaking about on Wednesday. I'll be focusing on how I build communities and gain, gain traction because your message may be beautiful. It may have a wonderful production team behind it. You may have the glossy photo with you smiling loads and looking successful. But if no one sees it and engages with it and converts, it's a big old waste of time. And so it's important to look at how we build it, uh, communities that are both meaningful, but also that generate us conversions and engagement as well. So over here on um, uh, on YouTube, if you have any questions, let me know. Likewise on Instagram and of course here on, on uh, Facebook as well. But let's jump in. So 
uh firstly just let me know where you're where you're watching from uh because i've put today next to everyone who sent in a question where they're based so it'd be quite interesting to see where you are uh, if you put in a um a put in your location location it'd be quite interesting to see uh, but let's kick off with uh catherine dar from switzerland uh working on some really exciting things by the way and there's an outside chance i might be in geneva uh with her soon in a month or so to uh to um jump in with her events it'd be really exciting uh, but she said, I'm starting a new project, the Never Too Late project, and I'll send workshops and retreats to companies. The whole thing is empowering big companies to empower their employees to start a new project or study or sport or challenge. It sounds like a really good idea. And um, I was wondering who really is my target market in the company? Is it HR? Is it other? Uh, and uh, and also, um, as you wanted to ask a question about CEOs on LinkedIn, which we'll come to in a second. So. There are two ways of looking at it. There is one way, which is what should you do? And one way, which is what works best. Melvin, hey man, you're coming, coming in uh, from Singapore. So good to uh, to see you here uh, on, on, on Facebook. So this is a really good question. If you want to get a project that empowers employees into, into a business, naturally we think uh, HR. But what you might wanna do is look at not just job titles, but receptivity. So the question I'd always ask for something like this is, rather than just what job titles am I looking for, but what kind of job titles, what, what kind of people are gonna be interested in or receptive to this type of scheme? So look on LinkedIn for the kind of job titles where it's things like people or person. Because for instance, a chief people officer, what does that say about the company? I worked with one rec uh, recently actually, a client and they've, they've got uh, kind of a head of people and rather than having HR, a head of people suggests the level of uh, tuning in on the part of that company to really investing in and focusing on their, on their people. There are obviously exceptions, but you don't call someone chief people officer or there was chief laughter officer I've seen somewhere, all that kind of thing, unless you really feel you want to invest in those kind of people. So that's a really, really important consideration there. Look for those job titles in your search. In addition to that, I think there are two approaches. Like I said, there's the way you should do it and the way uh, the way you can do it that's a bit disruptive and possibly a little dangerous at times, but gets you really quality results, so it's harder. That sounds stimulating. Let's do the other one first. So the first one you want to think about, Jonathan Flight. Hey, Bonsai, nice to see you as well. Uh, thanks, everyone, for jumping in here. The first approach, if you're going to approach a business with your proposal, yes, HR does make sense, an HR director as opposed to a manager, because rather than coordinating uh, um, decisions, they're the ones who actually make decisions in their space. The thing about going to an HR director is it's likely that whilst it is their kind of remit, uh, Catherine, to work on this kind of space of, of developing and investing in their people, uh, there will likely be some mechanism in place in, with which to uh, you, you to fall in step to. So the perfect example of this is about um, six, seven years ago when I was working at a headhunting business. If I had a CV of an amazing person that I was going to push out to a company, it's logical to go to their recruiter. That's what you should do. And what happens, think about it, the recruiter says, thanks for the CV. Let's feed it into our system. OK, let's make sure that you fill out all of the details on your business. And now you, Richard, are going to get in queue, sit with the rest of the herd and wait for us to come to you. And that's what you should do, because, of course, it's intelligent to uh, to, to kind of help them to help you and get in line and things like that. This is potentially a disruptive thing to suggest. But what we did instead of getting in queue with the other recruiters um, was actually go to heads of business units and where possible presidents, CEOs, managing directors. It can piss people off a bit because it's not entirely what you're meant to do. You're meant to go through a recruitment portal. You're meant to provide information uh, in a formulaic way. That means they can sift through it. Uh, and what last thing you want is some maverick doing it their way. But from the perspective, I'm mindful of the fact Michelle knows this space well and she's a uh, very big in HR. Um, I'm mindful of, of that fact, but when it comes to getting penetration with the business, we really won big by making it, it was a slightly harder, but much more effective, which was going directly over to the very top. So that the executive vice president of a business unit or even the CEO of the company, by going to the very top, 
what you get is the guy who says, this person's perfect. I want to hire them. We don't even have a job, but let's make it happen. HR, make this happen. Push this one through because by that point, they've already had a coffee with my client. Do you see what my candidate? Do you see what I mean? And by doing it that way, it's a good way of kind of forcing it through. It's not what you're meant to do, but it is a way that gets effective results. In the same way as if you look at all the people who have really made huge successes of their careers, they typically don't follow the rules. This is an ideal suggestion for those who are, uh, you know, working, uh, um, working in HR. They tend to not like this approach, but it does mean that you get through. If you do it wrong, you piss people off. So you need to be sensitive to that. But stepping in line, following the herd, getting into process is often a great way of fading into the background with everyone else. Far more effective to say, where is the point where I can really get a result? So let's target this practically for you, uh, Catherine. Yes, you can go to HR, but if your target market is is obviously getting a company to invest in its employees and you can reach up to, out to the CEO, do it. Because if the CEO says in principle, yes, I want to do it, I don't want to step on my HR team or my chief person officer to have this happen, but you've got my blessing, it kind of tends to always be the case that these things get pushed through. The higher you go, the more weight that blessing carries. It's hard to do, but I, I built my first career on this, the idea that rather than approaching marketing teams or even marketing directors with propositions on online marketing, I would go to the managing director of the whole business and it was harder to do. But if they said, I like it, it just happened. It, they pushed it through and it's far more effective that way rather than waiting and waiting and waiting and stuff falling out because of bureaucracy and things like that. So it's your choice. One is easier on the comfort zone and the soul and the emotion, but you tend to get a longer burn to try and get the result. You often have them fall away because lots of people need to be involved. The other one's way harder, um, but actually you end up with it being more effective uh, as your choice. I hope that helps. There's a few comments there on Facebook, I think from Michelle, HR business partners are good to connect with too. HR BP for sure. It's a really good job title, Ray, uh, uh, Michelle, to reach out to um, on LinkedIn. I totally agree. I think there's another question up here. Michelle, I've got a question. Richard, how do you hold a discovery conversation without saying too much to the point that they don't need anything else, but enough that the prospect need, wants to buy? Uh, I think I understand what you're saying. The discovery calls, strategy calls, discovery conversations, these kind of things I've had, um, always are most effective when one very important thing has happened first. And that is that the person I'm speaking to has been warmed up prior to the phone call. Now, that may be one of two ways. Ideally, it's both. The first way is passively warming them up through epic content. If you look, go and look at Michelle's content online, it's full of value. She gives great uh, content out. And as a result, those that, as I always call it, come into orbit around her are more likely to want to engage and have a discovery conversation. Now, that's them warm because they are making the conscious decision themselves to get engaged with what you're doing. The, the other way to do it, and ideally you do this as well, is to actually um, uh, is to in, focus on picking them off, I suppose, from the public space and having direct message conversations with them as well. That's where you can pre-qualify them. That's where you can ask them a bit about what they, what they have in mind. You can warm them up again by giving them yet more value and also check whether or not this person's really going to invest anything. But you can get so much out of it. If you can do both, what happens is you move to a wonderful place where getting onto the call is almost proof of concept that you're just a good person. I tend to find when I get on these, these calls that this isn't a brag, this is just process, but they tend to be already sold and understand that we're going to be doing this. And so the call itself is about me, this is to answer your question directly, directly setting the agenda for the call. If someone is going to use me as a consultant, they tend to want me to lead, okay? Maybe their solution that they're up, or rather they're, they're looking for a solution for themselves and their needs, but it's me to lead and make that happen. So I would start a call by saying, you know, great to speak to you. What I'm looking for today just to help you is three things. Firstly, just to get a bit to, of understanding about you, let me know a bit more about your background and, you know, your trajectory, how you got to where you are now. Secondly, I'd love to hear a more, bit more about your business. And then thirdly, we can, you know, get into detail about how we can help you. And that's how I, I 
validate the fact I'm going to say very little now. I say, so, you know, just without going on forever, of course, because of time, you know, give me some detail on what your background's like. And I just drop the odd question here or there. It's so tempting to go, yeah, 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 and then tell them all about myself. I should add a bit here and there to show I can relate to that person. But otherwise, I say very little because I've said to them, the agenda is I want to hear from you and you tell me about you. There's two reasons why you do this. Sure, you learn about the things uh, you're going to leverage to help the prospect buy, as, as Michelle has written. But in addition to that, you warm that, client, that prospect up more to the conversation. Because what you need to do is have that person feeling comfortable with talking about themselves to you. The best way to do that is shut the hell up and let them get used to the sound of their own voice. It's called momentum in conversation. Even if you have the most effusive, chatty person, if you shut them down, what happens is that person simply doesn't bother speaking anymore. If you enable them to talk and as they talk, you give them verbal agreement and what I call verbal nodding where you say, OK, uh huh, go on, that kind of thing. It encourages them to talk more. What you want is that person talking plenty so they feel comfortable doing it. And because of that, that's when the juicy details come out. So that's my approach. But it all starts way back, often a month before, where they catch some of your content because of another contact that they're in a network with. Then they see more of it. Then they start following you. Then they come into orbit and they love your stuff, sto stuff so much that this call actually is very much just it's going to happen anyway because I think you're great. They, they, it sounds crazy, but you want to be in a position where they're so warm that when you get onto the call, they should be excited to be in your audience, okay, because they see such value in what you do. So you need to wear on your sleeve and outwardly uh, show how much you help people by actually getting off your, you know, I say this a lot, you know, you've got to get off your, tr off your throne and go to other people's content and other people's value. Put in the comments, you know, um, some some things, get into conversations, operate away from just your profile page and people will see you popping up everywhere. And as a result, they'll know you're genuine in wanting to help people. So I hope that helps a bit, Michelle. There's a lot in there, but that, that hopefully uh, that helps you go. And uh, Sushi, also from Singapore. Hello. Uh, thanks very much. Uh, I love your energy as well. Uh, let's go on to the next question. We're doing an AMA today. Ask me anything. So if you have a question um, on startup businesses, let me know. Sophia uh, Papadopoulou, um, an absolute pleasure to see you here on Facebook. Um, Sophia is the uh, creative force, I believe, behind uh, Dot Lung's um, uh, wonderful work at, with Social Dragons. So check them out on Facebook. I understand it. With I heard great things about you, Sophia. And um, Dot Lung is going to be in the UK uh, from Barcelona in November. She's currently at Burning Man, probably having the time of her life. Uh, if you've seen that festival before. But in November on the 7th, we'll be doing Entrepreneur Business Live together. That's going to be massive. So I'm really looking forward to collaborating with her. Uh, there's a lot of you jumping in here. Bob Lowe as well. Hello, greetings on Facebook all the way from LinkedIn. I think that's how we connected originally. Uh, so let's continue. Um, just as a reminder of those who've tuned in recently, the Entrepreneur Business Live event uh, will be on uh, Wednesday in London. If you can make it, we kick off at six, but we actually start at 630 with the speakers. Um, <laughs> the Web, the website, therichardmore.com, is where you'll find information on getting tickets. So I'd love to see you there. But otherwise, if you go to Facebook and search Entrepreneur Business Group, and that's the URL as well, you will find the Entrepreneur um, uh, Business Group on Facebook for uh, for the actual event as well. And we'll be streaming the speakers there. Um, let's hop on to the next question. So Roland Langlois, uh, so Catherine was from Switzerland. Uh, Roland's from Haiti. And he's asked, how do you make quick effective market research for a new product it's very difficult because what we want to do is research often before we go ahead and actually um you know decide if we want to execute by far in the way what i feel is best because this runs into your marketing and sales as well roland is get vocal online your audience and also therefore your buyers are all online right now that is a fact so if you are online sharing what you're doing and on your journey, what can happen is you can start talking about something that's on your mind, such as a new idea. If you have a new idea, you can broadcast that you have a new idea and get some response from people. 
a perfect example of this is something that's coming out today, uh, but it's, this is its fourth week, which is the Entrepreneur Business Bulletin. That's my newsletter. Now, that comes out every single Monday. Go to therichardmore.com and sign up for free uh, to get that. But the idea is that that started a couple of months ago when I said to um, my audience online, who I got buy-in from for, for many reasons because of maybe my group or my courses or my value or whatever it might be, and I said, I'm interested in providing a, a weekly newsletter. Is this a good idea? And rather than me thinking, I wonder if it's a good idea, I get the people who are engaged with me to tell me. And that Overwhelmingly, it was yes, which is very kind because it's about my content, the content of those I, I watch, so big influencers, and also practical news in, for instance, social media and things like that. So things you can use, uh, news you can use, it's called, in your business. And that newsletter or, or digest is just a quick access to those links for the past week. And um, what I then did was I said, OK, it's clear you guys want this. What could we cover in the newsletter? I'm thinking A, B and C, but what do you think? And I ran a poll. OK, so I got the people that would have received that were going to receive it to tell me what they felt was best. By doing it that way, I moved to a place where I was fairly sure I could actually get something that people wanted. But in addition, the best part was when I launched it or was warming up to launch it, I could start tagging those people who had been responding and showing interest, even if someone didn't um comment or, or engage in the poll, they may have liked it. And so I was able to engage with them and say, hey, thanks so much for this. Here is the actual newsletter itself. And of course, then I got early engagement. Now, what this presupposes, Roland, is that you start warming up your audience about what you're doing as soon as possible, because it may be in the future you need them for something. So the audience I have now for the newsletter that's only in week four today, it comes out. So if you sign up, to, if you sign up now, you'll probably receive it a bit later on today. It's coming out in a few hours time. Um, if you uh, if you are someone who is um, reading that newsletter, that came about because of an audience that was warmed up from years ago. The eight step startup course I built in 2015 had people keen on it that had been warmed up before that who are watching today, for example. So what you do is you're constantly keeping your audience warm so that if you want to test something, get market research, that's how you get the quickest market research. It pays literally to have an audience continually kept warm here on YouTube, on Instagram, on Facebook and on the other platforms I use as well on LinkedIn. So that if I need to ask something, I have an audience I can ask in the moment. If I run a poll on Instagram stories, I can get reaction within hours from a from a decent number of people you know hundreds of people look at those stories every single day and it means i can say to myself that's a fairly good representative representation of what uh, uh my audience would want because they're my audience they're keen people and what i'm doing and they're willing to actually engage as well so that's what you should do if you have no audience and no following this is the reason why you should because it might be they just follow you just generally going about your life but if you keep them warm enough you can then ask them things and if you're calculated about your connections and a bit about the people you're sharing and, and, and engaging with, then you end up with some really well targeted people far better by a light year than going online to do some research or reading books. Because this represents not just market research, Roland, but your market research with your target audience because they're already engaged. So it's never too late because it might be that you can start now and start getting some people in, in, interested. And the wonderful thing is, some of you right now and those on other platforms as well who follow me right at this moment are potentially going to help me build a pro product that I don't even know exists yet in the future, maybe in two years from now, because it's about keeping people engaged and warm. There are always people and there have been some for years who literally have followed me every day. And that's a wonderful thing. Uh, it's because you resonate with them and they're the ones you need to tune into. So I really hope that helps. That's my philosophy on it. Is it a long play? Hell yes, it's a long play. But also you can get some fairly early traction within a couple of weeks of posting. You can get some interesting insights from people. And then, of course, you can ask, you know, uh, and, and get some response. And the dream is, of course, being in a wonderful place. If you look at someone like well, a major influencer, they can go on Twitter, tweet a question and within seconds, they'll get responses from people. So that's where you ultimately want to be, because it's not just asking the Internet. 
is asking your fan base and getting great response from them. So think about it that way. Um, again, thank you everyone for jumping in here. Give me a thumbs up if that made sense. That's my philosophy on this. So just want to check Instagram. I'm going to move you over so I can see if there are any questions here. Hello to everyone who's jumping in. Um, uh, just checking out here. Uh, yeah, okay, never mind. So results of people's being, being nice and writing kind comments rather than a question. If you have a question for me uh, about start a business, then do ask Michael Cohen. Hello, Emil FX. Nice to see you on Facebook as well. Let's look to the next question, which is Devin Scott. Uh, from the US uh, in um, Carolina, uh, sorry, at Wilmington. So how do you make quick, effective, oh, hang on, that was wrong. Uh, one I can always use more answers for is for clients. How can I start getting revenue when I'm still building my product or service? Where or where am I leaving money on the table? Getting revenue, Devon, when you are still building your product or service is actually really simple. And this is what I did when I launched my first course, the eight step startup course. Um, so that course was 73 lessons for business owners. I, I since uh, have closed it down to those who own it, own it. But otherwise, it's um, a pivot didn't really monetize you. I personally feel it's much more effective uh, on my website instead. But the idea behind it was it was 73 lessons. But to firstly create count accountability for me to actually build the thing, um, but also to recognize that it was going to take time to build 73 video lessons. Uh, I, I pre-launched it with six. That was it. I had six lessons. And that was all. And the idea was that I would speak. I, I warmed people up and I said, if you want to buy this, then buy it and watch it with me as I build. I was doing like one a day. Basically, I, I said to, I, I said to the people, you know, get involved at a ridiculously low price because I need advocates and I need testimonials for my product. But then I can move, you know, eventually you'll get the whole thing in lifetime access for a silly price. But what I need is, is traction because at the same time as building it, what you need is those early testimonials as well. The biggest problem most have, most people have isn't really that their problem is ridiculous or uh, sorry, that their solution is ridiculous or it is, you know, it's, it's not going to be good enough. Most pr people's products or services are actually really good. They really are. But the problem they have is obscurity. And what I mean by that is that it's that no one knows who the hell they are and can't find them. So with that in mind, what you need to do is, is get people talking about you. And so what I did was I offered it at, at the first price was something like seven dollars. Think about that. Lifetime access to 73 lessons. And those lessons, by the way, I didn't just record them on my experience. It was based on speaking and engaging with top business owners, professors and authors. So people like Jay Samet, people like um, what's the chat, uh, Andrew Ross Sorkin, all the way through to the likes of um, uh, professors at Wharton, London Business School and so on. And business leaders from Microsoft, from, from Google, from Facebook and Samsung. and So, on. so really amazing people had, had chipped in, too. But but I built that. Uh, uh, idea. This Devin, we're answering your question, so thanks for, for hopping online. Um, I, I, I built the the momentum behind it by pre-selling it to people straight away. So, how do you start getting revenue when you're still building your product or service? It goes back to the question I just answered for Roland, which is warm up your audience by telling them what you're doing. And when you tell them what you're doing, so that you're kind of vlogging or blogging, whatever works for you, the thing you're building. What happens is then people are saying, "Hey, I really like this guy." They're really interesting. He's really interesting. And what an interesting story. And hey, he's engaging with me. So I'll engage back. I'll write a comment and good luck with that. Or I like how you're doing this and you're constantly asking questions. So you're, you're taking them on the journey with you. What happens is they're warmed up because they're enjoying that journey. You become a bit of a soap opera rather than watching some nonsense on telly. They're watching nonsense online, which is you instead. But for them, this is really compelling. OK, when it's really compelling, they want to be involved. They're emotionally keeping themselves quite into you. And what happens is you can then say to them, hey, I, you know, thanks so much for being involved uh, um, and supporting this. Your encouragement means a lot, however. Uh, and then say, um, I'm actually launching the product in, in a month's time. But if you're interested, I'm pre-launching it to those who've been really supportive, uh, you know, at this price or in return for a testimonial is what I did to, for a few people as well. Um, what do you think? And what happens then is you get people not just helping you talk about it, but also engaging with and using it. And guess what? Now you're getting market feedback while you build it. It's fantastic because now people are saying, hey, I'm using this. I'm getting this error or this bug. So before you have your big launch party, whatever, you already people have people beta testing it. 
and it's a wonderful way of doing it. So you might be leaving money on the table um, in pre-sales. And what people need to understand is that there's very, very few instances when there aren't many customers out there. Most people have uh, a, a pool of potential customers they will never, ever even dent because we're talking about the whole world. And so even if you have a particular tight niche, there'll be hundreds of thousands of people you can reach out to. So get those early advocates in because they're going to be your leverage point for the future to get these people, to get the other people to start showing an interest. The huge error is being mute and working hermetically whilst you're building something and go, we built our product. Now we're going to go live. Really stupid. Even if that, if I was launching a new product now, as I just did four weeks ago with the um, entrepreneur business bulletin newsletter, that didn't exist. And I'd already signed people up to it. Okay. And if you want a monetized version of, of, of this example, the um, entrepreneur business live event, I had people buy it, wanting to buy tickets before I'd even uh, launched the event. I have somebody who asked the other day uh, if they could buy tickets for the November event because they couldn't make October or September. I'm like, okay, that's uh, that's on the 7th of November in like three months from now. But And I'd already uh, sorted out the event bright link. So here's the link. Off you go. And, you know, people buy stuff if they if they're bought into you and they buy if they're bought into you enough, they end up buying things early because they want in and they also buy buy stuff from you without really paying much attention. It's like Apple. No, better example. It's like Star Wars, beloved Star Wars. OK, Star Wars in the first three, uh, the new uh, trilogy. So episode one, two and three, we'll all agree weren't very good, but they still made millions of dollars of ticket sales because people would go watch it because you got enthusiasts. So those ultra purists still went to watch fi uh, the films. They knew were no good because all of the reviews like this is terrible. They went anyway because it's Star Wars simple as that even after the ninth episode's completed if disney they will by the way and already have started it if they run another star wars film and all the video uh, reviews are terrible you still go because it's star wars you know it's the same as anything if there's a brand new type pair of nikes they'll still sell even if it's a flop a relative flop they'll still sell because they're nikes people buy nikes do you see what i mean so when you have that kind of brand in place i said this to someone recently if you have a strong enough brand you could post a picture of you sitting on the bathroom in the bathroom on the toilet and someone would still like it because, of course, they think you're great. You see what I mean? They, you'd probably actually go do really well out of it because you get a lot of, you, a lot of people going, what the hell is this person doing? But there we are. Thank you, everyone, jumping in on Instagram as well here. And I hope that was a good uh, answer for you, uh, Devon. Let's look at a couple more. So one more question. Uh, one question here from Amanda Tran. She's here in London and she's asked, how do you convert leads into real business really good question from you amanda Le uh, lila smith hello uh, nice to see you on instagram and uh, I, I just want to mention lila smith who is going to be in london in uh, october on the 16th we're going to be running the uh, entrepreneur business live event there uh, hello mitchell hello brandy hello uh our poor Harimi. i hope i said your name right hello go marketing hello benjamin deal hello uh, dtb 601 hello zach Hello, loads of names I can't pronounce because you've got these crazy Instagram handles, but good to see you all here. So, uh, yes, it'd be good to see you, uh, Lila. And if you don't, if you're not connected with her on uh, LinkedIn, for sure, make sure you do uh, Lila Smith's uh, big deal. Or if you're on Instagram, it's, it's Lila Lasagna. Uh, there's a story behind that, of course, as well. So it's Entrepreneur Business Live uh, on Wednesday, uh, but in the, the one on in um, November, uh, I can't wait. We're going to be running with, with, with Lila um, there as well. Sorry, October the 16th. There's so many of them. Um, so Amanda Tran's question, how do you convert leads into real business? So a lead presupposes it's someone who's interested in you. Uh, I, you haven't said if it's cold leads or not. If, if we go with cold leads, it's actually the same kind of process, just a little step before. And it's actually in tune with the answers I've given to all the questions so far today. It's about warming up. Warming up can take a variety of, of um, uh, uh, guises, but there are two really important types of warming up leads that are going to turn into business. One is value based and the second one is evidential in terms of actual uh, delivery of product and service or data or something, something about how great you are. So a good example of this is if I wanted to position myself to convert a lead with working with a business, Amanda, what I would be doing is providing content that shows 
value, uh, but also gets me into in front of them in their newsfeed. I want to warm them up because they get used to seeing me all the time. 100% easily for a long time now, 100% of all my business is inbound. Okay, and that happens purely because, hang on, I just want to sort out Instagram for a second, pause, sorry. Um, so what, 100% of my business is inbound. And so what I do is um, I warm people up so, they, so I show up on their, on their stream. But what I also do is drop into their examples, maybe anecdotal, for example, um, of things I've done. What that relies you on you uh, doing, Amanda, is being great. If you remember last week's stream, I was talking about not being good, but being great. So using the Seth Godin uh, focus on being good means you're like everyone else. Being great means being remarkable. Someone posting a testimony. You're doing something above and beyond for people. It means people are going to start saying, this person's amazing. I'm really impressed. And they keep showing up. I will engage in some way. So, for instance, each week I get loads and loads of people asking to jump onto consulting calls. They pay the, the $300 for the hour and we jump on and have a call. And I help them out with often LinkedIn strategy or business or sales because I've worked there for about 16 years. And all of that comes from me sharing value in what I'm doing, providing a pure signal on that, but also sharing evidence that I'm half decent at what I'm doing because people talk about me. And... It sounds really arrogant, but all it is is spending time with people and sharing things and helping. If your strategy, let me, let me rephrase it, if your tactics are to share without agenda, so just share and share and share and help and help and help, what happens is you uh, end up acting out a wonderful strategy of getting um, uh, great results by having a lot of fun uh, helping people. And I think it's a really nice way of working in 2018. It's really fulfilling. Uh, it makes people happy about what you're doing. And you get one heck of a great reputation as well uh, by doing that. So focus on vocalizing, which might mean sharing content, Amanda, about how great your business is and wins you've had. But what you also need to do as well is recognize it is only half of the process to share value and content and help and so on. The second half is to engage with people. What that means is if someone dares like or follow you or something like that, such as right now on Facebook, Brandy Holloway, who is speaking an entrepreneur business uh, um, group uh, on Thursday this week, uh, has said hello. It's a shout out to you and it's to give some value to that person to validate their decision to engage. So if you engage with people, you know, direct messaging and so on, say, hey, thanks very much. I saw that you liked my video or saw that you, uh, you know, you wrote a, a great comment and you're comment back and so on you can move to a place where you're warming them up what that allows you to then do is get them to a better place where you're more likely to convert them conversion is always easy when someone is really warm and hot the problem mostly is that the people who want to do the converting the sales people uh, or the the people running the business or service don't want to put in the work and what the work really means yeah you know it's easy to say but the work rather than being a cliche, uh, actually means spending time one-on-one -on -one with the individuals in direct messages, on a phone call, uh, in their threads, on their comments, on their posts, spending time on a pitch doing that. People think I produce loads of content and that's what I do online. Actually, content represents a very small percentage, probably single digits of what I actually spend time doing when it's online. The majority, overwhelmingly, is actually going in and conversation, having conversations with people online. Video, a voice message on direct messenger uh, through uh, Facebook or something like that carries a huge amount of weight because it means you're deciding to step down from your throne and actually go engage with people. It matters, it matters, it matters. Okay. Uh, Brandy Holloway has just added some tips here. Quick, quick tip for IG users leave a comment of four words or more to improve algorithms and make the content engaged person to content back. I would add to that as well, Brandy. If someone leaves you a comment, uh, you should ask a question back because that allows them to then join back in and, and ask you a question. You know, it starts uh, bringing the uh, a conversation back around. If I just say, thanks for your comment, it doesn't really do too much. But if I say, thanks, how's the week going? Or, or what did you think about this or whatever? They're more likely to respond. And that really helps the algorithm because they're thinking, well, there's conversations now. It, it really does matter. But the key thing, isn't just leaving comments. The key thing is leaving meaningful comments. 
For instance, if I, um, I, you know, Michelle Raymond here, who has just commented, I know that she has spoken at an event with me in March uh, uh, this year, but also that she produced uh, some wonderful content on GDPR. And also in terms of data and being safe there, she's definitely one to speak with. Having that level of knowledge only comes from spending time with people online. Disproportionately, all my time is spent with potentially the audience. It's not the top level content generation, because if you're not in the community, then there's not this, it's all vacuous. And it means you don't know these little bits of detail. And it means that it doesn't show you care that much. So if you look at my LinkedIn presentations, the short version is there's the three C's I use. So there's content, there's connections, and there's community. And you think content is essential as being a content creator. It's not. It's the same as YouTube. As someone who spoke, spoke to me recently talking about YouTubers and moving over to LinkedIn and things like that, it's the same thing. Your content might be great, but unless you have the right content, and more importantly, if you don't engage in the community, you lose because no one will see the content which you are spending a huge amount of your time building. So the reason why I've not even hit 5,000 followers on LinkedIn, and I'm a minnow with that kind of numbers, I'm, I'm absolutely tiny, but I get great engagement is because I spend time in the community. Yes, the production of the video is nice. Yes, it helps a little bit, but it's bullshit if you think that that's the reason why people engage in your content loads. It's not. It's because you spend time with people, not with your content. And if that's the, the one big takeaway from today, I think it's a really important one. Um, so Amanda, to convert leads to real business, it's spending time with those people when they engage you back in your content. If you look at Lila, Liza, Lila, Liza, Lila Smith, uh, who's commented over here on, on Instagram, and look how I'm engaging here. Again, this isn't a brag. This is just being practical. I like to be a practitioner. Rather than me just speaking live and switching off the comments and engaging with people as we go, Lila and I uh, connected on LinkedIn probably six months ago, five months ago. Uh, I would have more than likely come across her content first because she's way more illustrious than I am there seen it resonated with it written comments and then when she responds i write more comments then i write comments on other people's comments on her comments on her post because those things matter to me and by spending time there we moved to a place where she was very kind and said you know with however many tens of thousands of followers she got she she said something like yes i would be cool with jumping on the on a onto a phone call and uh, and then going from there and that phone call turned into a wonderful Zoom chat that was a, a, a bit of production, then turned into she's in London and we're going to run an event together. And that's a bit of conversion there, if you like. But you can convert people in different ways. By being a good guy, that helps. But spend time in the community. In real life, you do the same, the equivalent of the same thing, which is finding great people and uh, being a decent person yourself. OK, your best friends are the ones you'll probably you know, when you connect with them, you have a deep and meaningful uh, understanding of each other. And that's important to try and keep that going. Certainly online, uh, content is absolutely not everything. It is the enabler uh, uh, to get people to come into orbit around you. But from there, you have to you have to engage in the community more. Uh, Michelle Raymond, quality comment here on, on Facebook. People appreciate you meeting them where they are. They feel special, make time and part with their money and pe with people who get. Absolutely. Uh, people's minds are blown when they look up to your content and think, wow, there's so many people engaging, but I'll write a comment because it matters to me. Then they receive a, try this, by the way, don't just type it. When they receive a voice or even better video message form from you in their DM, amazing. And they're like, wow, thanks so much. Because it's disruptive, it's different. And for someone, as I said before, someone to get down off their throne and come and talk to them, it makes them feel special, especially if you've got lots of, following and i literally was at zero in march this year on linkedin literally at zero like 120 followers or something like that and it grew epically because i know how to build communities which is jumping in and speaking with people on the ground not just at a high level through content so if he ran over i hope that's useful to you amanda uh, you also asked another question as well um uh how do i get one-on-one -on -one with linkedin contacts um it's a good question one way to do this is to um is to actually build build value and content things like that but if they engage with you you send them not a hey let's jump on a one-on-one -on -one, you actually send them a thanks very much and you just focus on connecting for the sake of it 
And what happens is, is that has to, if you, if you don't gain them or try and uh, have some kind of a, um, a cell or anything like that, don't have, don't have a preset bot driven, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, message that goes out and gives them a link. It just turns people off. Yes, some bots can work, but I, I suggest strongly, uh, unless you're in a position where you have so many leads you can't move, that you focus on engaging with one on one saying, hey, thanks very much. It really matters to me that you engage in my content. How are you? Get conversation going. Don't try and strong arm them into a, into a call. Just get a conversation going. But when you get to that point where they say, hey, I've been talking about me or you've been asking questions about me. What is it you do, Richard? I then share some value and help them out. And then I might move to a place where if they're feeling good and I'm like, wow, that sounds really interesting. I say, I'd love to hop on a call. Uh, are you free now? If they say yes, press call on your d direct messenger box and then you're away. Um, but you have to earn the right. You simply can't uh, decide to hop on a call with someone because it will, it will piss them off because people don't like to be sold to. They need to be in the right place. They want It has to be them that says yes. OK, not you forcing it on them. And so you have to earn the right by giving great value and helping them and relating to them, but also moving to a place where like, I want to be on a call with this person because you're giving me great, great value. And, and um, my my view is that you should look for a cue. And a cue is simply when someone says, um, wow, that's really amazing. Or I hadn't looked at it that way. Thank you so much. That means a lot. That kind of thing. That really, really is your cue to say, well, why don't we hop on a call then? So that's what I would, I would suggest, Amanda, try that. Um, one last question before we finish uh, from uh, Nadine Liver Langua from um, Canada has, has asked my question, Richard. When looking to outsource, do you prioritize loyalty, devotion, and work ethic over skill, knowledge, and experience? Actually, it depends. Because it wouldn't it be cute if I just said, oh, of course, loyalty, devotion, and work ethic over skill, knowledge, and experience? It actually depends. It depends what I'm outsourcing. Um, I have some people in my team who I work with who are not the most skilled at what at the thing it is they're doing. They're skilled enough. They're not like stupid, <laughs> but they're skilled enough that they can do what that what's needed. But the loyalty and work ethic and the devotion to the the you know the movement, if you want to call it that, or the um, the kind of the thrust of what I'm trying to do is something that I'm so keen on that that it it's perhaps a fairly menial job, so I'm really behind it. There are other people I work with who, for whom the the loyalty and devotion doesn't matter, mostly because they're just being paid. And what I need is a skill set. I don't need loyalty. I need a skill set. And this is what happens with the gig economy. Of course, you have people who are um, great at a particular thing and the leverage for that particular thing. So in my team, I mean, I could have far less people. Uh, hello, Sheila, and I saw your, your thumbs up, so thank you. You have far less people working with you in a team doing these different tasks or more people doing more niche tasks. And that's what I have. I have a set of people who are there to um, do things that need to require them to be in my inner circle. I need them to be reliable. I need them to care. Those are working my newsletter, a good example, but also other things as well. People in the back end working with my content, they have to give a shit because if they don't care, then they're just going to work to their, you know, like they get paid and that's the end of it. And I've found overwhelmingly that those who are purely paid, those who, who you don't know to do a task, they will ju just do the task uh, through skill set. And actually something like um, installing, this isn't hard and fast, but if I was to go out and get someone, outsource someone to plug in something onto my website through WordPress or something, well, actually, that would be, I just pay for the skill, that's all. However, if I'm looking for someone who uh, is going to be with me maybe longer term, I really would be looking for the loyalty and devotion side of things. A good example of that is selling. Some of the best people I've ever had in my sales teams are not the best salespeople by skill set, but they're good enough. However, we're massively offsetting that by the fact that they are amazing in terms of their loyalty and devotion to what we're trying to achieve. They really get behind it. They really back it. 
and uh, I'm thinking of one person in mind uh, who is just uh, such a wonderful person to have in my space. She's really helped me a huge amount with my events as well. And she is doing it because of her keenness to get behind the movement we have. OK, so both is your answer, maybe. It could be that you need to audit. Well, what is it I'm trying to outsource here? Because if I'm, for instance, if I'm outsourcing I'm out, uh, the, uh, both the photos and the video for the event on Wednesday are two, two separate businesses, two separate people coming in. Are they the greatest photographers or, or uh, uh, videographers in the world with the best fit, uh, best kit even? You, they will tell you, no, we're not, but they're pretty good. They're pretty damn good. They're good enough by a long way, way better than anything I could do, which is an ups, upgrade for me. In the future, hey, we might change, but the reason why we've got them in is because I know they're good guys. That counts for a lot. So there's um, work ethic, sure. And some people I work with are, my God, their work ethic's terrible. And they are so, like... <laughs> slapdash with what they do they're a nightmare to get hold of but that doesn't matter because i need them for their skills it's like do you know what if i could just i just need you to do this one thing because you're the only person i know who can do it this well that's all that matters so you need to order and decide first hopefully that helps nadine and uh thanks so much thanks everyone for jumping on uh vince bonser priank nadine over on uh instagram my sunny box is amanda hello amanda uh question here as well uh from the what would you, I can't see it under the other under the camera. What would you suggest for bookkeeping? One hundred percent, I would suggest an accountant. Nadine, I'm not being flippant. What I actually mean is practically get an accountant. My strong advice is, unless you are running a bookkeeping business, you do not do it. And it was actually my cousin uh, who gave me that advice when I uh, many years ago he said the number one investment for you, Richard. The best thing I ever uh, spent money on, Richard, is an accountant. And uh, I almost agree. The best thing I ever spent money on was a cleaner for my house. Sounds ridiculous, right? But that, that £22 a week uh, just to come in and clean the house. No more arguments with my wife about who's going to do the cleaning. Plus, it's like, you know what? I have so much to do. I can't. I, I, it's hard to sanction that time, downtime to go clean the house. Let's have someone in to do it and do a wonderful job because I really don't want to. So let's get someone in who, who's going to do a good job. Uh, and luckily, she's been with us for six years. So there's an example, Nadine, of someone who's got um, loyalty, devotion, work ethic, but also uh, she's got a good skill set as well and knowledge and experience of cleaning. Um, but I think uh, for bookkeeping, it is a mistake to spend hours, which it will be of your time, firstly trying to understand how to do it, and then secondly actually practicing on, on bookkeeping. I was engaged with someone earlier um, today who was talking about Facebook ads. Getting Facebook ads really right is an art. And I, uh, uh, the wonderful Melvin Tan, shout out to you, is a guy who clearly knows what he's doing, has the skill set. I would rather pay and defer to a good guy like that to do my Facebook um, uh, ad operations for me then be taught how to do it. Someone I was speaking to early, early today who doesn't do Facebook ads for a living. They do something completely different. But they paid someone to teach them how to do Facebook ads. I personally feel that that's the kind of thing you should outsource fully to someone who's really good because there's not enough hours in the day. And that's the same answer for you uh, in terms of bookkeeping, Nadine. I would let that be for someone else. Um, thank you so much, everyone who's joined in today. It's been episode 100 and 11 of the entrepreneur, uh, sorry, startup business Q&A. Too many brand names going on at the moment. Uh, Wednesday this week, if you're not part of the entrepreneur business group on Facebook, immediately after this stream, please go to Facebook. In the search bar, type entrepreneur business group under groups. You will see my group. It's 3,600 people in it. Join because on Wednesday, as well as all the other value you get, on Wednesday there will be a stream at 630 London time of the speakers we have uh, and uh, those who can make it if you're in London please join uh, it will be amazing to see you there because after the speakers we have an hour of networking and free beer all night so come along for that kicks uh, doors open at six and you can buy a ticket under products if you go to the richardmore.com but otherwise have a wonderful day thank you very much everyone on uh, YouTube I'm gonna end the stream there